Alright guys, here is part two of the uh, rise of industry. So, protective tariffs, right? What Henry Clay is doing is that after a long controversy with Great Britain over shipping rights convinces most Americans of the need to develop their own manufacturing sector to end their dependence on imported British goods. So efforts to develop an iron and textile industries began in New York and New England during that embargo of 1807 that Jefferson passed. Now, it accelerated during the War of 1812 because America lost access to European goods. After the war ended, however, British companies began flooding U.S. markets with less expensive products. It undercuts their American competitors. So, in response, northern manufacturers are lobbying Congress for federal tariffs to protect their industries from the unfair British competitors. So Congress responds by passing the Tariff of 1816, which places a 20 to 25 percent tax on a long list of imported goods. Now, alongside all this, you have the market revolution, the emergence of free enterprise, capitalism, the result of industrialization, supply and demand, and private business owners setting their prices and receiving profits from it. By the 1850s, the patent office was approving about 28,000 new inventions. In 1844, for example, Charles Goodyear patented a process of vulcanizing rubber. Vulcanized rubber is soon being used from everything from shoes and boots to seals and gaskets, hoses, and yes, eventually tires. In 1846, Ellis Howe patented his design of the sewing machine. It's improved upon by Isaac Merrick Singer, who founds the Singer Sewing Machine Company, which initially produced only industrial sewing machines for use in textile mills, but eventually offers machines for home use. Uh, some of you may have grandmothers who have a swinger, or excuse me, a Singer sewing machine. So, uh, the mech mechanicalization of formerly handcrafted goods and the removal of product from the home to factory dramatically increased output of goods. For example, in one nine-month period, uh, Rhode Island women who spun yarn into cloth on hand looms in their homes produced a total of 34,000 yards of fabric of different types. But in 1855, women working uh, in one of this gentleman, Francis Cabot Lowell's mercantil, uh, mechanicalized mills produced more than 43,000 yards. So, 10 times as much. Now, these are just early industrialists. You also have Samuel Slater. They were involved with the Boston Associate Cotton Mills, and they are trying to gain competitive edge over smaller mills. So, um, their success... They expand into Massachusetts. In addition to Lowell, they're building new mills and things in New Hampshire. Um, they also build into Maine. By the end of the Civil War, they had 878 textile factories in New England. Altogether, these factories employed more than 100,000 people. They're producing more than 940 million yards of cloth. So we have this emergence of a factory system. Alongside the production of cotton and wool and cloth, uh, you also have other crafts that are increasingly becoming mechanicalized and centralized in factories. Shoemaking, leather tanning, paper making, hat making, clot making, clock making, and even gun making had all become mechanicized in one degree or another. At the end of the 18th century, most American families lived in candlelit homes with bare floors and unadorned walls, cooked and warmed themselves over fireplaces and owned few changes of clothing. All manufactured goods were made by hand and as a result were usually scarce or fairly expensive. So the automation of manufacturing process changed that and made consumer goods that had once been thought of as luxury items widely available. Now all but only the very poor can afford necessities. 
Rooms can be lit by oil lamps, which are brighter than candles. Homes can be heated by parlor stoves, which allowed for more privacy. People no longer needed to huddle around the hearth. Iron cook stoves with multiple burners made it easier to prepare more elaborate meals. People can afford carpet and unupholstered furniture. Even farmers can decorate their homes with curtains and wallpaper. So as production became more mechanized and relocated to factories, the experience of workers underwent significant changes as well. Farmers and artisans had controlled the pace of their labor and the order in which things were done. This is different in a factory. Employees are expected to report at a certain time, usually early in the morning, and they work all day. They can't leave when they're tired or take breaks other than at designated times. Freedom in factories is very limited. Uh, drinking is prohibited. Some factories did not allow employees to sit down. Doors and windows are kept closed all the time, especially in textile factories where fibers could easily be disturbed by incoming breezes. Mills are often unbearably hot and humid in the summer, and in the winter, workers often shivered in the cold. So obviously, workers' health is suffering. The workplace poses other dangers as well. The presence of cotton bales alongside the oil used to lubricate machines made fire a common problem in textile factories. Workplace injuries are also common. Workers' hands and fingers are often maimed or severed um, as they're caught in the machines. In some cases, their limbs or entire bodies are crushed. Workers who didn't die from such injuries um, would certainly lose their jobs and with them their income. Corporal punishment of both children and adults was common in factories, where abuse was most extreme. Children sometimes died as a result of the injuries suffered at the hands of overseers. So as the decades pass, working conditions deteriorate in many mills. Workers are assigned more machines to tend, and owners increase the speed at which the machines are operated. Wages are cut. Employees who had once labored for an hourly wage now find themselves reduced to piecework, paid for the amount they produce, not for the hours they are working. So criticism of industrialization blamed it for the increased concentration of wealth in the hands of the factory owners. And, the, and under the labor theory of value, the value of products should accurately reflect the labor needed to produce it. So you have worker activism that is beginning to emerge. One example of this is Thomas Skidmore's Working Men's Party, which emerged in uh, Connecticut. And it lodged a radical protest against the exploitation of workers that accompanied industrialization. But worker activism is not long lived and it's much less common in the 1830s and 1850s. And this is because you have German and Irish immigrants that are pouring into the United States in the decades preceding the Civil War. So native-born laborers are finding themselves competing for jobs with new arrivals who are willing to work longer hours for less pay. The Irish especially are trying to immigrate and get away from the suffering of the effects of the potato famine. So this is not a luxury they can keep. American men with families to support are grudgingly accepting lower wages in order to keep jobs. As work became increasingly de-skilled, because you don't have to be an artisan to work in a factory, um, no worker becomes irreplaceable. So then no one's job is safe.